everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nyambura Simiu. I'm an entrepreneur and a passionate organic gardener. Uh, today we are going to have our speaker talking about um, entrepreneurship. But before then, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this evening. We ask you to guide us for this meeting. We pray that as we go through this meeting, you're going to help us to learn what you're supposed to learn. And Father, you're going to be glorified at the end of this all. In the name of Jesus, I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm going to welcome Jeff to uh, introduce what the Kajando We Want CBO is. All right. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, so what is the, the Kajado we want? Uh, the Kajado we want is a community-based organization uh, that deals with uh, uh, development and community matters in uh, eight different areas. Uh, the first area is infrastructure, roads, and street lighting. Uh, as we all know, uh, we constantly need to follow up to have our roads uh, uh, improved or built where there, is, where there are no roads. Uh, so yeah, that's one of our areas that we like to focus on and help uh, lobby for improvement or uh, building of roads that are not developed. Uh, the other is also water and uh, sanitation, uh, where we, 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 uh, we want to ensure many areas as possible can get uh, water and have proper sanitation so that we can improve the hygiene in our societies. And uh, the third area is environment and waste management. Um, uh, in the, it's, it's sad to see in the 2023 that uh, waste is not uh, managed as we'd like, we'd like to see it uh, managed, um, where you can see piles of garbage being uh, piled up on the sides of the roads. Um, so that's another area we'd like, we like to focus on. Uh, we also focus on security and community policing, uh, just to improve security in our societies, advocacy for the vulnerable uh, groups such as children, women, youth, uh, people with disabilities and the elderly. Um, so we like to, uh, to give a voice to the voiceless and uh, follow up on their needs. Uh, another area is health and wellness. Um, this is uh, both physical and mental uh, health. Uh, we like to, we'd like to promote uh, better health facilities, uh, create awareness on mental mental health, and uh, just to improve the uh, the health in our societies. Um, the other area is education and literacy by advocating for better schools, uh, better practices in schools, uh, and so on. And uh, we also like to follow up on tra trade and uh, job creation by lobbying uh, different agencies and uh, government organizations to either set up industries uh, and help create employment uh, for the youth. Uh, we intend to achieve all this uh, through creating awareness, public participation, and uh, partnerships with uh, different bodies, both government and non-governmental uh, organizations. Um, yeah, so that's basically a brief introduction of what the Kajedo we want uh, and some of the areas we'd like to focus on and uh, improve uh, in our societies. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that introduction. I'm now going to introduce our speaker of the day. Our topic of the day is uh, Africa, African youth, business and climate change. And our speaker today is Mark Dumi, who is a very passionate young person. He is the CEO and co-founder at The Database, a talent acquisition company fighting youth unemployment through its internship placement program. The Database helps employers, recruits interns, volunteers, and apprentices across all sectors. Uh, they are based in Upper Hill, Nairobi. He is currently in his fourth year at the African Nazarene University, pursuing a Bachelor of Law degree. 
During his time in school, he has participated in various social entrepreneurship competitions, such as Safaricom and MK Africa's My Little Big Thing competition, the Halt Prize and Enactus. Together with his co-founders, they emerged the top team in the first edition of the Strathmore Business School Startup Incubation Program, that is StratQ. The team also featured in KCB's Bank Annual Real Sense Magazine 2022 edition. Mark has also previously worked with Systems Acumen for Youth-Led Development Solutions as a policy and advocacy lead. SAYDS is a youth-focused NGO empowering the youth to bring about lasting change in their communities through systems and complexity thinking. Last day, he's been a resident of Kajian North for the last seven years and is a local business owner operating a laundry service, trend and button laundry. Mark is a passionate, is passionate about three things in Africa, the youth, the environment, the youth and its environment, and enjoys video games, cooking and road trips. So we have a very loaded uh, entrepreneur, young entrepreneur in the house tonight. We're looking forward to hearing what he has for us. So let's sit back and listen to Mark. Welcome, Mark. Um, as has been said by my... Yes, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. As has been said, my name is Mark Rumi. Um, yeah, I'm 24 years old and uh, the three things I'm passionate about most are um, Africa, its youth, and the environment. So those are the three things that wake me up every day. Those are the three elements of this society that I'm really trying to better. As has been said, I've been a resident of Kajiado County. Um, a big thank you to the Kajiado We Want CBO for this uh, uh, opportunity to speak to you today. And I hope that uh, this will be a learning experience. Uh, as stated, uh, the topic is quite wide, and so I will not delve too much into these specific subjects. So when you speak about Africa, when you speak about the youth, and when you speak about climate change, they're all quite diverse uh, subjects, and they're quite deep uh, in themselves. And so what I intend to do is to just show you how uh, these three uh, issues correlate, and how we can use them to resolve some of the issues that we're facing even in Kajiado, and ensure a brighter future for youth in Kajiado County, Kenya, um, and Africa as a whole. So I would ask that uh, the, uh, the presentation be put up so that we can begin immediately in the interest of time. Yes. Um, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so as previously stated, I am co-founder at The Database. The Database is a startup. We only started operating um, uh, about a year and a half ago. The Database is based in Upper Island. What we do is we are, a, we are a talent acquisition platform. So we're trying to fight with unemployment. The Database actually started during the 2020 pandemic, uh, COVID. This is when we started really thinking about it because youth unemployment was already at a high in Kenya. And then with the, the challenges that came about with COVID-19, the unemployment rate only, uh, only rose further. And so instead of sitting down and, you know, sitting on our hands and complaining, blaming the government, blaming the private sector and such, we decided to take it upon ourselves and try to actually do something about the problem while also creating an opportunity for ourselves. So as you can see there, my name is Mark Kuni. Uh, my co-founders are Eric uh, Ochieng in the middle, and Adrian Mangare um, to, the, uh, to the far left. So Adrian Mangare is our CTO, he handles our tech, the website and such. Uh, Eric Ochieng handles our, our, our finances. We have a broader team, we are the founders. We have um, an investor, she's a lady, she's based outside of the country. And then we have um, a team below us. Next slide. Yes, so these are these are the problems that we are dealing with um, first. Uh, statistics from the Africa Survey in 2022 
This is a survey that was done by the Chikuts Family Foundation, they're based in South Africa. And so the, the Africa Youth Survey was carried out um, in 15 African countries. So this is Angola, Congo Brazzaville, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Gabon, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Sudan, Uganda, and Zambia. In each of these countries, they interviewed 300 young people on a strict 50-50 gender basis. Um, these are the people who responded and 40% uh, of those who are surveyed said they were students. And so this is important so you understand exactly where this information is coming from. Next slide, please. Yes, so Africa's population is expected to double to around 2.4 billion over the next 30 years. Currently, our population is at about 1.2 billion. Half of that being um, people younger than 25 years old. As per the World Bank, the youth account for 60% of Africa's unemployed. By 2050, we will comprise 25% of the global population. And so there is, Africa has a youth bulge and our population is constantly growing. Uh, this is the case as, as has been seen even in Kenya. And this becomes a problem because youth unemployment is essentially a ticking time bomb. If you do not give uh, 1.2 billion people, if 1.2 billion people do not have dignified, well-paying work, to give them purpose, to give them something to do, a means to put food on their tables, then you can certainly expect that there will be um, problems for us in the future. And so what I'm trying to say here essentially is that the youth unemployment, um, unemployment pro problem is not limited to the youth. You're not solving it just for the youth. We constitute the majority of the Kenya, of the Africa, Kenyan and African population, and this shall continue to be the case. And so when you marginalize the bulk of your population, you're obviously going to have problems. And so when, when you talk about youth unemployment, this is why it's a problem that needs urgent solving. And so furthermore, in this uh, survey, it was found that six in seven, this is 86% of young people say that they are concerned about the lack of opportunities currently available for young people in the country with near universal concern in Kenya at a worrying 94%. That, that means 94% of Kenyan youth who are interviewed are worried about being able to find work within the country. And this manifests itself in various ways. You know, it's, it's a hopelessness. It's, um, it's us essentially giving up on our futures. Recently, we had a spate of stabbing incidences in Nairobi and across the country insecurities on the rise. I genuinely believe that unemployment may not be the only reason, but it definitely is a contributing factor to the rising insecurity that we've witnessed, the rising cases of immorality as well within the society. Secondly, 41% of Kenyan youth said that they that creating new, well-paying jobs should be the top priority for Africa to move forward and progress. And so Africa is a continent or is a continent of many opportunities, uh, which most people would call problems. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of problems. There's poverty, there's disease, there's 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 human rights abuses, left, right, and center. However, 41% of, of Kenyan youth decided to focus instead. You know, they feel that the priority for the government should be in creating new well-paying jobs for them. And so it's not infrastructure that the youth are really championing for. It's not security that's the main issue, you know, in the back of their minds. It's getting, you know, it's being able to put a warm plate of food on their tables each and every night. Uh, moving on, the Africa Development Bank estimates that about 10 to 12 million youths enter the job market each year in Africa. Yet only 3.1 million jobs are created annually. As you can see, that's quite a large disparity. So this, these statistics are reflected not only in Kenya, but in Africa as a whole, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa, so countries under the Sahara Desert. This, these are the statistics in general that apply here. And so you find that you, uh, we, we're only creating 20 to 25% um, op job opportunities for the number of graduates or people entering the job market that we're getting every year. This is a problem and it's going to mount. The, the issue is that it compounds. 25% today will not be 25% tomorrow because again, the people in university, our, 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 our population is constantly increasing. And so the rate of unemployment is only going to increase if we do not do something about it. Lastly, only 30% of youths across the continent describe the standards of living as fair. 25% of them, in fact, describe them as poor. And so, as you can see, only a third of youth in Africa can say that, that the standard of, or standard of living is fair. And so this may be, you know, it might be a, a, a bit subjective. You, you might say some people have preferences different from others, but it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign of where 
you Africa has left its youth. When you do not give us jobs and you do not give us a means to make something of ourselves, to be active economically, then this is what you get, that 25% of us are describing our living standards as poor. And this has only been exacerbated by the events of the past years, um, including COVID-19 and in a country like Kenya, where when we have general elections, the economy generally turns to a halt. Next slide, please. And so when we speak about unemployment, uh, re referring to what I was even speaking about earlier, it is not just a youth problem. It's We're not solving unemployment just for the youth because the youth constitute the majority of the population in, in Africa, in Kenya, and as well as in, in places like Ajado County. And so what happens when you do not regulate unemployment is that poverty is the first thing that comes along. That's a given. And then you have drug, drug and substance abuse. As human beings, we need a purpose. And we also, you know, we need a sense of fulfillment, that you're doing something, that you're contributing to something greater than yourself. Most youth do not have do not have that feeling. We do not feel like we have something to do. We do not feel like we have we have the skills, we have the ability, but we do not have the, the, the means to contribute actively to our societies. And so this is where the drug and substance abuse comes from. We have nothing to do. You're staying in uh, you're staying in the house all day. Cheap liquor is available outside and, and such. And this is how you get into drug and substance abuse, as well as even trafficking. And then trickling down from that directly would be crime. This is what I was speaking about um, just now in terms of the, the, the rise in insecurity in this country. And then you have immorality as well, with people willing to engage in such undignifying acts in order to just put a meal on their tables. So, and so even when you look at the youth and, you know, all this entire conversation about what the youth are doing for money, whether it's sponsors, whether it's all of these things, you also have to look at where we're coming from. You go to university for four years, you've graduated, you sit home for two years, and then an opportunity comes by. And I'm not justifying it, but I'm saying that you have to at least try and, and, and see where we're coming from as the youth. These are not people who are born into these lines of work. People find themselves there. And then lastly, I would argue that indirectly, unemployment is also, also causes environmental degradation because any climate expert will tell you that there is a direct correlation between poverty and, and, and environmental degradation. So that societies which are doing better economically um, have more resources and are more willing to focus on conserving the environment and fighting climate change. And so with a poorer society, which is caused partly by unemployment, there will also be a result in, uh, it, it will also result in um, environmental degradation. Next uh, slide, please. Yes, so when, when we talk about the issue of unemployment in Kenya, um, and, and employment in general, it not only affects the youth, um, the, the, there's also costs that come with how we're doing things that are faced by employers. And, and so this is a report called Hiring in Kenya, Current Methods, Hidden Costs, uh, and the Top Value of Performance. Uh, this was a report for the financial sector given in Kenya, FSD, and shortlist. And so what the findings of this report were was that HR and senior business managers spend around 20 hours per hire before they reach the interview stage and feel that much of this time is wasted. And so when, when you find that um, the vast majority of businesses in Kenya are SMEs, they do not have the resources or even the willingness to, um, to invest in full-on human resource departments. So what you find is that instead, People who have other designations, managers, supervisors, and such, are the people who end up conducting the, the recruitment process for these companies. So what happens is that these companies spend up to up, up to 20 hours per hire. Remember that a typical work is around eight or nine hours long. And so when you spend 20 hours per hire, not, not for your entire recruitment, per hire for one hire, um, that's essentially about, um, what, two working days? And this is before they reach the interview stage. So it's 20 hours down, 20 hours of, of work you're paying someone for, for a role that they're not supposed to be performing. You're paying them um, for work that they're not supposed to be doing. And this is only until the candidates reach the interview stage. And then more time is dedicated into interviewing them and the entire onboarding process. Now, the, in, the inefficiency is driven by a combination of um, certain factors. Number one is they need to manage multiple application channels. And so Kenyan employers use typically very informal um, hiring channels. So what you'll do is you'll create a post, you know, share it on WhatsApp, share it on Telegram, share it on Facebook, uh, you know, share it in your church groups and such. This is what people typically do um, when they're hiring, especially SMEs. So one, one inefficiency that comes out of that is that you need to, mal to, to manage multiple application channels. 
So you're getting hundreds of applications. Some are coming through your email, some are coming from phone calls and SMS, others are coming from Facebook. And so there's even some you forget to check. And this is this is where that 20 hours goes to. Secondly, there is a flood of applications. On average, around 200 and sometimes up to 800 people, most of whom are unqualified, apply for these jobs. Um, so this is another challenge. Kenyan job seekers are really quite desperate. And so people will apply for whatever role is available, regardless of whether they know they qualify or not. People will just try. And if you've seen the kind of applications that um, government bodies receive whenever they put out um, any opportunities, be it KRA or county governments, they, they, they put out maybe 300 positions and they get thousands of applications each and every time without fail. And it's, it's, it's not different even for employers. And this is one of the challenges they're facing. Lastly, there is a reliance on manual CV screens conducted by, by both um, HR business managers and recruitment managers. So one of the poor hiring practices that we have um, as, 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 as Kenyan employers is that we focus only on, on CV screens. And, uh, and as you know, someone's CV does not always necessarily offer you, you know, the most accurate picture of how they are. It may give you a history of their academic and professional background, but there are certain nuanced qualities of a person that you cannot determine from a piece of paper. These are what you call the soft skills now. So if someone is someone hardworking, will they keep time? Do they know how to communicate? Do they know how to dress? And so these are some of the challenges that Kenyan employers are also facing when we talk about um, the, the, the hiring issues. And there's also the issue of just mistrust, poor character among the people that they hire. Uh, next slide. So that was the problem statement regarding, um, you know, the, uh, the, the youth and unemployment. Now we move on to the second issue, which is climate change. And I will show you how all of these issues intertwine. Um, please bear with me. Um, towards the end, I'll show you how all of these things are, inter and are interrelated uh, to a degree. And so we come to climate change. So Africa amounts, accounts for the smallest share of global greenhouse gas emissions at just 3.8%. This is in comparison to China, not even Asia, just China alone, which accounts for 23% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the, U the United States accounts for 19% of these emissions, and the European Union accounts for 13% of emissions. Next slide, please. And so even with the, 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 the low um, contribution of Africa to global greenhouse gas emissions, we still face the most severe effects of climate change. Number one being um, extreme heat. So extreme heat can come in various ways. It can be either the, 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 the warm seasons are extended or you can have heat waves like we saw um, in India last year, which killed, you know, dozens of people. So extreme heat is one of the challenges that we're facing. And especially if you come from uh, Rongai, Kajiado, Joto, Jua, Tunayeleo. And then secondly, there's precipitation changes. When you talk about precipitation changes, this is a, this means you're either getting too much rainfall or you're getting too little rainfall, both of which have you know um, an impact on our agriculture and especially for a country like Kenya whose backbone is agriculture and even a county like Kajiado whose primary uh, means of income generation is um, livestock keeping and agriculture. And then we have aridity. Aridity is simply the expansion of deserts. And when deserts expand, like the Sahara Desert, for instance, which I believe is actually, funnily enough, should be reducing in size because of climate change, but other deserts are actually growing because of climate change. And so what this does, it you know, it, it disrupts um, it, it disrupts the ecology of certain areas, and it contributes further. It aggravates the climate change that we're facing. And then lastly, we have the sea level rise um, affecting water resources. Uh, you know, you, you have water bodies mixing and then you have agricultural, it's, uh, you know, sea level rise also affects agricultural production. Uh, there's ocean and savanna ecosystems which are also affected by this, uh, with coastal populations and infrastructure being highly vulnerable. When sea levels rise, obviously cities along the coast um, are, are, are the ones which face the highest risk. Next slide. And, and so even to localize this issue more, when you talk about the effects of climate change in Africa, according to the short range assessment, SRA findings, uh, conducted by the National Drought Management Authority in the, in the county, this is Kajiado County, by the way, Kajiado is in a crisis phase with more people requiring humanitarian assistance. Globally, it's about 200 million people facing um, food insecurity right now because of climate change. And the most affected sub counties in Kajiado uh, is Kajiado Central, where the predominant source of livelihood is pastoralism. 
The sub-county has witnessed massive loss of livestock, depleted pasture, and has been worsened by the African army worm invasion and poor performance of the of the of the of the long and short trains, leading to high malnutrition levels. And this was the county drought coordinator Hussein Mohammed speaking. And so, as we speak right now, this is the situation in Kajiado County, where Kajiado Central is the worst affected, um, but other regions of um, of Kajiado County have also been affected with with Kajiado North being the least affected, simply because it's, it's a bit more urban, and so people have other means of generating revenue. But this is the case in the majority of Kajiado County. And so we, we move on to Sri Lanka as a case study. And I'd like you to please um, go back to that slide, yes. Um, the, the, the other one, previous slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the, the slide showcasing the palace. Uh, the, the previous slide, yes, this one. Thank you. So I'd like you to take a moment and look at this picture. So this is uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a, is a, is a, is a country in, in, uh, in Southern Asia. What you're seeing here is the presidential palace uh, in Sri Lanka. And these were the scenes in July of 2022. What you're seeing here is people deposing the president of uh, Sri Lanka because of certain measures that Sri Lanka had taken to fight climate change. And so before I even get into this case study, the reason why it's here is my argument with uh, uh, about climate change and why it's a problem is it is not just climate change in itself that's a problem. We have to look at also the steps that we're taking to mitigate climate change. Sri Lanka is a country that shares quite a number of similarities with Kenya, you know, being um, you know, a developing country and such. I'll show you the statistics um, later. And so Sri Lanka is a case study. Uh, which demonstrates the consequences of, of enacting poor climate policy. Um, next slide, please. So this is what happens when, when, when a country does not enact the correct climate policies or we rush to enact climate policies without looking at the, 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 the consequences. Sri Lanka is a developing Asian country with a population of about 22 million, 15 million of whom are directly or indirectly dependent on farming. With tea exports alone before 2021 paying for over 70 percent of the country's imports another major source of income for sri lanka was tourism just like kenya sri lanka has a youth bulge and the majority of the population um, consisting uh, of, uh, the majority of the population consisting people under the age of 35 and so this is why i see sri lanka as a, as a relatively good case study because we, we share quite a bit of similarities and so this is a timeline of what happened in sri lanka in August 2021, the Sri Lankan president, um, at, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this has, I think it's begun a bit late. So it, it began in April, actually, of uh, 2021. And so what happened was the Sri Lankan president banned the use of fertilizers. The, the reasoning behind this was that um, it was claimed that uh, fertilizer is a major contributor to climate change. And, and, and so, you know, because of farming because of the, the, of the materials, the ingredients that are used in it, like ammonia. And so Sri Lanka was told to try and um, farm in a more ecologically friendly way. And so they were supposed to ban fertilizers. And this is what the president did in April. And uh, come May to, uh, to around mid 2022, 85% of Sri Lankan farmers experienced crop losses. 85% of their farmers experienced, uh, experienced crop losses. Rice production, which is their staple, fell by 20%. And prices for rice, their staple, rose by 50%. Uh, Sri Lanka imported $450 million worth of rice. And remember, this is a country that was previously self-sustained. In um, August of 2021, the Sri Lankan president attempted to reverse the fertilizer ban and then reinstated, he reinstated it two, two days later. So the reason why Sri Lanka was doing this was because of what you call ESG, um, environment, societal, and governmental um, projects. And so these, 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 are, these are projects which are meant to make uh, government policy and, 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 and businesses, essentially, to become more friendly to the environment. By, en by enacting um, these changes, the ban of fertilizer and such, Sri Lanka managed to get the highest ESG rating in the world. It did better than Switzerland, which uh, had a rating of around uh, 96, and the USA, which had a rating of around 51. But come um, 
May 2022, Sri Lanka defaulted on foreign debt repayments, becoming unable to borrow money. It, deval it devalued its currency and inflation rose by 30%, making the government unable to import fuel, food, and medicine. In June 2022, food prices had risen by over 80% year on year. In July, on, on July 12, 2022, Sri Lanka deposed President Gotabaya Rajap Rajapaska, and that's how we ended up with the, with the image that you, that you saw. And so what, um, what I'm saying here is, is that climate change in itself is a problem. And you have to take into account that we only contribute a very small percentage of the carbon emissions, you know, in the world. But that aside, we also have to look at our specific case as, as Africans, as developing nations, when we're enacting climate change policy, with Sri Lanka being, being a prime example of that. But that said, we now move on to the solutions. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm a, um, what, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And so when, when I see problems, I see solutions, because when you, when you solve people's problems, they will pay you, you know, that, that's what people, uh, that's how the society typically works. And so as I move on into the solutions, I'll also say that I've, been, I've divided the solutions into the climate change solutions as well as solutions for unemployment. These are proposed solutions. Uh, we will begin with the climate change solutions. And so uh, what I'll say is that my, my insights on climate change have been informed mostly by two, um, by, by, by two people in this space. The first one being William Nordhaus. William Nordhaus is an American climate economist He's a professor at Yale University, and in 2018, he won the Nobel Memorial Prize for Economic Sciences. Next slide. The next person you'll see, you'll see on your screen is Bjorn Lombok. Bjorn Lombok is the president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Uh, he has written several books, uh, one being The Skeptical Environmentalist, Secondly, being cool it, um, uh, a third one being false alarm, how climate change panic costs us trillions, hurts the poor, and fails to fix the planet, uh, among other uh, writings that he has done. And so what Bjorn Lombok and William Nordhaus um, simply ch champion for out of, the, out of the research is that what, we, what we're dealing with as a planet right now is we have unrealistic climate change policies and costs. The UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, urges nations to limit temperatures to 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. Models actually reveal to, that for us to achieve the 2.7 degree goal, we, the world must stop all fossil fuel use in less than four years. This is from an article that was published um, in 2018. And so by 2018, for us to reach the goal set by the UN's IPCC, we were supposed to have stopped entirely using um, carbon fuels by 2022 for us to be able to reach these goals by around 2000, uh, 2050, 2060. Fossil, fossil fuels, however, provide cheap, reliable, efficient power, whereas green energy remains uncompetitive. And this is the problem. I believe that, you know, when, when you want to inspire people to, when you want to, to inspire a cultural shift, what you do is you make the solution cheaper. You do not you 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 do not force people into it, and especially when you're looking at the situation of developing countries like Africa and and uh, uh, developing countries like Kenya, and counties like Kajiado, we do not have the the the, the resources. We we are not in a position to to set aside all our interests in order to just uh, try and enact climate change policies. We have to take a more realistic look at the situation on the ground, and the situation on the ground. Um, when, when you face reality, is that fossil fuels are cheap, reliable, and efficient. And secondly, is that even as we continue to use um, fossil fuels, which I'm not, I'm not necessarily campaigning for, you have to understand that our contribution to global carbon emissions are almost negligible. It's three percent, and so we will be sacrificing, you know, quicker development in order to meet ESG goals and such, while our people suffer, and it's especially the poor who are going to, to face these problems. The International Energy Agency estimates that in 2040, that in 2040, fossil fuels will still meet three quarters, 75% of world energy needs, even if the, the Paris Agreement is fully implemented. This is the International Energy um, Agency. They're talking about 2040. And so as you can see, 
in as much as we may want to transition to green energy entirely it's not quite as easy as it might uh, as it might seem and if the entire world will still be meeting its energy needs 75 percent of its energy needs through carbon uh, through fossil fuels and this is exactly how they have built their civilizations up to where they are now i don't see why it should be any different for africa and so next slide please uh here we one of the things that Bjorn Lomborg and um, William Nordhaus campaigned for is that we are supposed to invest more in research and development of newer ways to save the environment. And so when you look, for instance, at wind and, and, and solar as alternative sources of renewable energy, they have both their pros and cons. Uh, we all know their pros. For, in, for instance, with wind, it has a low levelized cost, it has a small environmental footprint, um, and then the wind, uh, they can be quickly constructed and the payback is quite quick. But the disadvantages of wind energy is that is is sighting and transmission first of all. So you know, in terms of wind, uh, locating places with with um, enough wind and also how you transmit this power to the places where it's actually needed. And then there's also the the question of energy storage. And here's the thing: when you speak about energy storage, you have to realize that batteries are made out of unsustainable materials. And so when you're speaking of of of, of the need to store energy that in itself will lead to even more um, pollution because you're using lithium cells, you're using, um, I'm forgetting other uh, chemicals that are used in batteries, but lithium ions especially are a common one and these are quite toxic to the environment. The, another thing with wind power is that it's intermittent. It's not reliable, you won't have it 24, 7, 365. Um, then the other issue is, is with disposal. They are mostly made um, out of carbon fiber and so once they, they, they run their course, it becomes quite difficult to dispose of, 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 of the, the wind winds. Then you have interference with wildlife. This is birds especially knocking into um, the propellers. Then with solar, some of its pros are that it's abundant. You know, the sun is, is, is around almost every day, everywhere. Zero emissions. Uh, sighting is quite um, easy because, you know, you can place solar panels almost anywhere, especially in uh, equatorial countries like Kenya. And in and, and especially in um, counties like Ajado, you know, with the, with, with, the, with the kind of sunlight sunlight that we experience, and then they have a low maintenance cost. But the cons of solar is that number one, it is also intermittent. Secondly, energy storage is another issue. Thirdly, solar is more expensive than coal and gas, and so this may not be essentially a problem here in Kenya because we do not use coal and gas. But around the world, coal and gas still account for quite a large chunk of energy um, production. And so, you know, when you weigh it out uh, against solar, people prefer cheaper sources of energy. And then lastly, there's also the issue of disposal of solar panels, because funnily enough, it's actually cheaper to make new solar panels than it is to recycle them. And so, you know, most people are not really focused on, on, on recycling solar panels, which, they, which then become another source of, um, you know, environmental degradation. Next slide. So, this is a list of tertiary institutions in and around Kajiado. Um, we have African Nazarene University, where I'm from, of course, um, Adventist, you have Masai Mara, Uma. Yes, the entire list is there. So these are tertiary institutions in and around Kajiado County, but you still, uh, you, you, you still have um, the technical training institutions as well, and among other small colleges. And, and so what we're saying is, next slide, please, is that we need to create localized solutions for climate change. We need to place Africa first. And the reason why um, I included that list of institutions in this presentation is that I feel, and the numbers prove, that we as a country do not, adequate, uh, we, we do not adequately invest in research and development. And this is where the Western Asian countries really blow us out of the water. Because you look at institutions like Harvard and Yale and Oxford, Oxford literally came up with a vaccine for COVID-19. And why part of the reason why, part of the reason why you don't see this in Kenyan universities is that number one, you know, there's there's a lack of initiative maybe among students. And then secondly, we're also not adequately funded. It's not been made lucrative for us as the youth. It's not been made attractive. And so that entire list of institutions is to demonstrate to you just what kind of resources we as a county and in, you know, and even as a country in general are wasting. The youth are the ones who have the answers to these things. 
And the reason why the climate change issue is also quite pertinent to the youth is because when we're speaking about climate change projections, even uh, looking at the future, remember that it is us who are still going to be on this planet. I'm only 24 years old right now. 30 years from now, you know, if I eat right, if I watch uh, what I'm doing and everything and the good Lord protects me, I'll only be 54 years old. You know, I'll still be working class within this country. And so when we talk about the challenges of climate change, you have to understand that it is us who are going to have to pay the price for climate change. And so that is why it is important that we be involved as the youth in the creation of solutions to climate change, because it is us and our children who will have to deal with the consequences of climate change. Climate change, which has been caused by generations older than us. And so this is why you now have to bring us in. The government and the private sector, as well as other non-governmental organizations, need to collaborate more with universities and other institutions of higher learning you know, include us in the conversation when we're talking about finding um, solutions to climate change. I understand that it's already happening to a degree, but I'm saying that we can certainly do more. We can certainly invest more. And how? Uh, and and the, the result of this is that we will create localized solutions for climate change. Uh, firstly, Africa is not a major polluter, but a major victim of the effects of climate change. And so the problem that we have is that we're focusing on mitigating our carbon emissions when in fact, our, our carbon emissions are negligible. What we, I feel, we should be focusing on instead is the effects of climate change. Because even though Africa, Africa contributes the least amount of carbon emissions, the consequences of climate change will be felt hardest here, as we're already seeing. And so we need to reorient ourselves. Instead of thinking, focusing first on how to reduce our carbon emissions, we need to focus instead first on mitigating the effects of climate change because those are already here with us. Secondly, our needs and objectives are not aligned with the West. Our difference in wealth and uh, in wealth status um, and population distribution mean we are working toward different goals. There's a phenomenon occurring in Western worlds right now, known uh, in, in Western countries right now, known as population collapse. And so population collapse is simply when your birth rate is lower than your death rate. And so what happens is, you know, you don't turn out of old people, you run out of young people. Uh, you know, you don't turn out of young people, you, uh, you, you, you run out of old. Okay, I'm sorry, I think I got that a bit mixed up. But the point is that Western countries, there's a population collapse, while African countries have a, a youth bulge. So even as we're thinking about the future, our needs are not quite aligned. And then these are first world countries, we're third, third world developing countries, whose whole economy is essentially the backbone is agriculture. And so when we bring in the youth to this conversation, we will be able to create solutions that are more responsive to the African situation. And then lastly, by doing by pioneering climate solutions tailored to third world countries, we could place Kenya in the forefront of fighting climate change and its effects among developing countries. Just like the UK and the US, you know, took the you know, they took the lead in terms of fighting COVID-19 because it's their institutions. It's their students, it's their scientists, their doctors who are developing um, vaccines to COVID-19. We can we can take the same stance in terms of um, climate change and develop solutions that are tailored to third world African countries. We have so many students, so many scientists, so many, and it's not just scientists. You know, there's 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 lawyers who can do uh, policy making. There's for for almost every profession, there's a way for us to contribute um, to the climate issue. Uh, next uh, slide. And so in terms of the creation of localized solutions to climate change, what I'm saying is that the youth also need to take initiative. Number one is there's free upskilling and soft skills training. An example of this is ABSA uh, Bank Kenya, which has trained up to now over 200,000 youth since the program's inception uh, in 2015. The program is called ABSA's Ready to Work Initiative. It is a free training curriculum that provides young people with work experience, uh, people skills, money skills, and entrepreneurial skills that are required for employment or self-employment. I myself am, am an alumni of ABSA Ready to Work uh, 2022. I was there and it was helpful. So these are some of the opportunities that I'm saying youth need to jump on. You need to make yourself better. You need to, you, 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 in order for you to have a seat at the table, you need to show what you're bringing to the table. You have to earn your seat at the table. So, so it's not just, you know, we are, we are relegated, we are, you know, we're marginalized and such. It's when you get a seat on the table, what do you bring? And so this is how you build your capacity. Number one is you look for this free upskilling and soft skills training. Secondly, there's volunteering. Uh, a, a fantastic example here is the Rotary Club, which is an international service club that began 117 years ago. It birthed Rotaract clubs in 1968. Rotaract 
brings people um, ages 18 and older to exchange ideas with leaders in the community, develop leadership and professional skills, and have fun through service. I am a proud member of the Rotaract Club of Africa Nazarene University, where I am also the Rotary Foundation Director. I sit on the board for the club. So what being the Rotary Foundation Director means is that I am essentially a fundraiser for the club. So the result of this is that I have been able to gain skills and validate my learning more through Rotary. I am a law student, but now I've been able to do fundraising through an international um, non-governmental organization. Rotaract clubs are available throughout the country, and it's not just Rotaract. There's quite a number of clubs you can join, um, which can you know, which can enhance your offering as as a um, as a student. And then lastly, there's innovation. So we need to find ways to monetize solutions to societal and global challenges. Kenyan startup funding has risen from forty-seven million dollars in two thousand fifteen to over five hundred million dollars um, in two thousand twenty-two. So what I'm saying to um, Kenyan youth as well is that. One of the ways, one of the easiest ways to make money is to solve people's problems. You identify a need, you identify a problem, and you find a solution to it. If it's a big enough problem, people will pay you for it. The database is an exact um, example of that. That's what we're doing. And so to show you just how much money is there in solving problems, in 2015, Kenya startups raised a total of $47 million. In 2022, they raised a total of 500 of over 500 million dollars and so what i'm saying is um with kenyan youth we need to be more innovative and we need to in it wakujituma jitume go find a problem you decide that this is my problem to solve and believe me if you do a good enough job if you're diligent enough and you speak to the right actors and you know your timing is right then definitely there is support for you out there but you also need to take initiative um now kazi connect is one of the fruits of initiative that I will tell you about. Kazi Connect is a collaboration um, between the database, Rotary and Rotaract districts 9212. So these Rotary and Rotaract districts span Kenya, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Eritrea. Uh, Kazi Connect is there to facilitate the exchange of various employment opportunities between Rotarians and Rotaractors. Rotary is typically for people aged um, 31 and above, while Rotaract is for um, Please go back to the previous slide. While Rotaract is for um, essentially for the youth, people aged 18 to around 30. And so what we did is as a member of the Rotaract Club of Africa Nazarene University and CEO at the database, I identified a need and I saw that Rotaractors are not exempted from you know, this, the, the, the epidemic of unemployment in this country. So what we did is we have partnered with, 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 the, with the entire Rotary district, this is across four countries, um, in order to try and solve this problem and facilitate how Rotaractors can get you know, various employment opportunities from Rotarians. And so this is just an example of the opportunities that are available out here for the youth. We are a young company, we are a startup, and now we have partnered with an organization that is international and we've partnered with them across four countries. And so this is what I'm saying, if you're diligent enough and you know, and you actually try and solve a problem that there's people out here, there's organizations, there's the government, there's businesses out here that are willing to collaborate with you to solve this problem. Next slide, please. And so um, my, my, my call to action for you as employers, as stakeholders in Kajiado County is that you need to give the youth a chance. Um, resumes that reflect meaningful work history, whether through actual job experience, volunteer work, or having completed an internship at a company, are heavily valued in today's job market. Internships and other work readiness programs play an important role in bridging skill mismatch by providing the foundational skills required to enter the job market. Work readiness also reduces the likeliness, the likelihood of youth unemployment. So what we're saying is um, we need to, even if you are not in a position to actually give a youth permanent employment, is you can contribute to making them employable. You all hear these jokes about the youth, you know, you're fresh out of campus, you're 25 years old and I expect you to have 10 years of experience. You know, it's, 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 it's a bit difficult. And so what we're saying is even just entering the job market becomes difficult because of something you call a skill mismatch. 
Skill mismatch is the gap between what we're taught at school versus what's actually happening in the ground, you know, in actual businesses, because there's a lot of trends, things are changing quite quickly. And so skill mismatch is that gap that employers are usually complaining about that, you know, these guys are green, they're not trained enough and such. So how we bridge that gap is you, you can make us more employable. Give us volunteering opportunities, give us interning opportunities. Um, if you're not in a position to give a job, that is, we would obviously prefer jobs, we prioritize jobs. But if you're not in a position to do that, then you can give us, you know, at least an internship. Give this person the relevant skills that they need, the relevant training to make them employable. And so the compounding effect of that is that as a county or as a country in general, we'll have a bigger pool of competent young people that we can employ. And these are, and we will also make them employable even outside of the country. And to illustrate just how we can do this is close to 1 million youth enter the job market annually in Kenya. Yet in Kenya, there are 7 million SMEs. If only if, and, and when you say small and medium enterprises, please believe me, they're not quite as small as you might think. And there's also, because um, there's still micro enterprises. And so if we have 7 million SMEs, these are the drivers of the Kenyan economy. Why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't each of these businesses take at least even just one intern, even just one volunteer per year? That would mean each and every student coming out of university or college or entering the job market would be able to find some sort of a placement, even if they don't get an actual job. You know, they would become more employable. There's seven million SMEs. You yourself, yourselves, as parents, as as, as guardians. You have sons and daughters, you have nephews and nieces, you have businesses. How many youth have you given an opportunity as you as you complain about your son or your daughter, who, who you've schooled for so many years, you've used so much money to get to the level where they're at. As you complain about the inability to get a job, what are you yourself doing to, 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 to give Kenyan young Kenyans an opportunity or at least make them more employable? And so that's a question I'd like to ask you. Next question, uh, next uh, slide um, is for employers, um, Another thing I'd recommend is that you, we need to reconsider our hiring practices. In order to reduce the cost and inconvenience of hiring, as well as secure high-performing candidates, employers ought to consider the following. Number one, you need to use comp competency-based assessments. Uh, for example, that's work samples, trial periods, and internships, rather than traditional interviewing to, to assess candidates more effectively. And so this is the, 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 the issue of, and, and even as a, um, as a talent acquisition company, we, we face this problem a lot, whereby you essentially have to vouch even for someone's character, which you really cannot do out of, you know, even one or two face-to-face -face interviews and their CVs. And so we are we are urging employers to try and start incorporating more competency-based assessments. So you can ask someone, for instance, for samples of their work, of, of, of previous work, or you can have trial periods. Uh, these are essentially, um, what are they called? I'm forgetting um, the, the, the correct name. Uh, that's okay. Uh, you can also use internships. And actually quite a number of Fortune 500 companies hire 80%, their, their, their entry level jobs, 80% of, of, of them go to people who've interned for them because internships are also a period for you to assess these workers more in depth. Um, secondly, businesses need to invest in setting up internal HR departments or outsourcing um, hiring to private recruiters. As previously illustrated, the cost for hiring for you as employers in Kenya, and why sometimes you don't see it, is, is, is it is hidden in just the time that you use in recruitment. And then thirdly, you can use online assessment tools to filter applications. And so these are all things that we, we, we can do for you at the database and we can sit down with you to help structure these things for you. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm almost concluding. So another solution that we are proposing to youth unemployment is bilateral labor movement agreements. Bilateral, um, bilateral labor movement agreements, are, it's, it's a big term, I know, but essentially it's just how two countries can collaborate to exchange work opportunities so that, we, so that our labor becomes an export. As you know, in Kenya, we have an excess of labor and, um, you know, we, we, we need to find ways to to, to give these people jobs. So we see bilateral labor movement agreements as another solution. In 2017, the World Economic Forum rated Kenya's education system as the strongest on the African continent. In 2018, the World Bank ranked Kenya the top African country for education outcomes, first out of 43 million countries. In 2019, a Kenyan was named the most outstanding teacher in the world. 
and awarded a prestigious $1 million prize. Additionally to this, more than, half, more than half of African youth say they are likely to at least consider moving to another country in the next three years. 69% say they would only be emigrating temporarily and plan to return home with the skills and experiences gathered abroad. Uh, abroad. So what we're saying is we need to refocus labor mi migration to become more intra-African in the beginning and then global in the long run. So when we talk about sending people out for work, I know what comes to mind is the Middle East, the UK, um, we're talking about the US and such, but we, we, we want to add a twist to this. And so we're asking, take the example of uh, people in ICT. And, we, and, and so someone has a degree in ICT, let's say from the University of Nairobi, and they want to uh, go seek work, let's say in the UK or in even worse in Asia. The chances of this person succeeding against people who have been trained there locally, you know, these are most likely better universities, they have better um, facilities. You also have the cultural factor, you know, these are their own people and such. So the chances of, of a Kenyan going to Australia, for instance, um, in, especially in the technical space, for instance, and succeeding there is quite difficult. And so what we're saying is we need to, we need to rediscuss um, bilateral labor movement agreements and turn them into Africa. A good example is the Congo. They recently joined um, the EAC. The Congo is a Francophone speaking country. The rest, of, um, the rest of the East African community primarily speaks English and Kiswahili. And so there is a need for English teachers in a place like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Even a quick Google search will prove that we just Google English teachers needed in the Congo. You'll see if they're needed. And so we have a surplus of teachers in this country while within our economic block, there's other countries that have a lacking and they have a need for that. And so what uh, this is a very um, uh, long subject, but essentially what we can do is we can sit down and collaborate with various stakeholders. So private recruitment agencies like ourselves, the government, county governments, we can collaborate with people like the ILO, other non-governmental organizations, and simply um, assess the deficits um, of, of, of workers in other African countries. So identify where there's a lacking in other countries and identify where there's an, access, an excess in other countries and facilitate this exchange. This will also result in you know, faster economic growth for African countries uh, because we, all of this brain drain, there's so many brilliant Kenyans who are leaving the continent and you know, all of these economic benefits are going outside the country. The, 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 the train system in London was actually designed by Kenya. And that's a fun fact. And so Kenyans have the ability to do, the, to do these things among other Africans as well. And you have to understand that as African, as Kenyans particularly, we're quite well placed to capitalize on this. Uh, the next slide is, uh, it sa says we are running away from the problems to seek opportunities, not realizing that in those problems are the opportunities we seek. I'll repeat that. We are running away from the problems to seek opportunities not realizing that in those problems are the opportunities we seek. Uh, this is, not, this is a, a famous African pro, uh, proverb, uh, <laughs> uh, which I'll leave you. Actually, um, uh, it's actually not. This is just a quote I have, and it's just to rally African youth to look more locally um, and invite uh, other stakeholders as well um, in Kajiado County and beyond to, you know, not run away from our problems, but see them as opportunities, see, see them as as opportunities that we can monetize and we can use them to give a brighter future um, to the youth in Kajiado and beyond, surely. Thank you so much for your time. That marks the end of my presentation. My contact information will be available. Um, that's for the database. There's also my personal contact information. Um, thank you. And I believe we will go into the question and answer session now. Mark, for that uh, passionate presentation. We have followed through and we can tell your passion uh, all over the Kenyan, the African youth employment and climate change. It's quite evident from your presentation. Uh, I had asked the listeners to type their questions in different platforms. And so far we don't have any questions that we've received. I um, mean, it's just to say thank you so much for everyone who tuned in and thank you so much, Mark, for that presentation. We truly appreciate your time and all the best in everything that you do. I think we're going to close the presentation now because I haven't received any questions from the presentation from whichever platform people are watching from. 
Thank you. So let's pray and close the meeting. So dear Lord, we are grateful once again for bringing us to the end of this presentation. We thank you for the young man, Mike, who was able to talk to us passionately about business, entrepreneurship, and the African youth. We pray that this passion grows even the other young people and even the clarion call that he gives us the older people to be able to provide opportunities for the younger people so that we can develop our continent. We pray that you give us wisdom and guidance as we endeavor to do this. In the name of Jesus, I pray and believe. Amen. So thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next week.